Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ian. Uh, so I'll be talking about a recently published method called lightweight random indexing. Uh, it's basically something that you can use to combine data sets for text classification off across multiple languages. Uh, so this is just going to be like a paper presentation. Um, this isn't something that I see very often. Uh, mostly what you see these days around text data sets across multiple languages is like machine translation or something. Um, and this is something separate from that, but we'll compare against it at the end. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll go over some like high level code examples uh, that may be oversimplified, but uh, you'll get to see what the method looks like at a really small scale. Uh, so here's our agenda. We'll go over what text classification is, uh, see what the vanilla version of random indexing is, and we'll also talk about random projections and how it differs from those. And then we'll look at lightweight random indexing and see the results from the paper. Uh, but first, a little bit about me. Uh, I studied at Michigan State University for uh, graduate school and undergrad. Uh, I stuck around to do research in evolutionary computation. Uh, and then after graduating last year, I came to Quantum Black, which is the um, sort of advanced analytics arm of McKinsey Consulting. Uh, yeah, I've worked on lots of industries, and it's, I'd love to talk about it if you want to hear anything about it. Um, yeah, so content. Uh, so what is text classification? Uh, hopefully everyone knows, but if you don't, uh, this is basically learning this mapping F from a, a document to a particular label or multiple labels. Uh, examples would be like labeling what kind of abuse a toxic comment is giving, uh, applying search terms to scientific articles, or um, applying news uh, topics to news articles. So this is an example. This is a Reuters news article. Uh, and then for this, Fiat Chrysler is signing some kind of merger. So you would want to apply the labels automotive and business news to this. And basically, you're just caring about this function f. Uh, but of course, most machine learning models can't just ingest a raw document, so you have to encode them somehow. Um, lots of ways to do this for a bag of words, which is the most simple. You just count occurrences of words. TFIDF is a little more fancy. It's like a bag of words, but you get these statistics out that tell you how important a certain word is based off of how often it occurs in a document, things like that. Um, and then you also have even fancier word embeddings, uh, like word to vec where you're mapping words to vector spaces, where you get all those cool results where you like add two words together and get a different word that's kind of related to it. Um, yeah, so let's see what this looks like in Python, because we are at PyData. Um, if we have this very simple corpus, this is more to just establish a running example. Uh, we would just instantiate our TF-IDF vectorizer from sklearn, fit transform, and then turn it into a, back into a dense matrix, because it operates off sparse matrices by default. Set the columns to our feature names. And this is what you get. It's what you would expect. Uh, the has a very low weight in all of the documents because it occurs in all of them. And those words that are unique to each document have higher weights. Yeah. So what happens when our corpus turns into multiple corpora that are across multiple different languages? Um, yeah. So multi-language data sets present like a kind of a unique challenge for text classification. Um, it's the same problem that you're dealing with. So in the news articles example, it would just be multiple news articles across many different languages, but you're trying to assign the same labels to them. Uh, and the documents may not be parallel, which means that they aren't just direct translations of each other. They're going to be localized, in this case, journalists uh, writing in their home language, not just translating things from the English version, uh, which causes problems sometimes. And then, um, yeah, so there's lots of ways that we can tackle this problem. So let's look at some very naive ways first, and then we can look at the, the fancier ways. So what if we just concatenated them all and then filled NAs with zeros? Uh, this is probably the simplest and maybe first approach that we would all think about. Uh, this either forces us to create too large of a document term matrix, but if that's not an issue, maybe we would choose too small of a vocabulary for each language so we wouldn't capture enough information. Um, yeah, so what else could we do? Uh, we could just build a separate classifier for every language and then just combine the results. Uh, this runs into the problem that every classifier that you're building now has less data and you're losing information around like proper nouns or maybe cognates that are shared across all of the languages that mean the same thing. Like if we're talking about PyData in Spanish, it still means the same thing. 
Uh, yeah, so the approach that we want needs to be able to use information across all of these data sets in one data, or in one large data set, uh, hopefully get around the curse of dimensionality, um, and only create one classifier to capture this sort of information that we need that is shared across all of the languages. Yeah, and by the end of this presentation, hopefully we'll fill in the mystery profit step and figure out what, how, how we can do this. So first, uh, we'll talk about random indexing. To plug the paper really quick that I'm sort of presenting, uh, here it is, you can go look it up. It's published in the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research uh, in 2016. Um, most of the notation that I'll use is theirs. Uh, most of the explanations I'll use are also theirs. Um, yeah, and before we go and look at random indexing, we'll look at a very similar method called uh, random projections, uh, which you may have heard of, um, which kind of just builds like some theoretical support around like why it sort of makes sense to do this. Uh, yeah, so like I said, random indexing is closely related to random projections. Uh, this is the basic setup for a random projection. Basically, you have your data in this huge X matrix, and you have this lambda, which is your projection matrix, which maps the original M features to some different N dimensional feature space. Uh, a lot of times this N, I guess M is supposed to be greater than M, but whatever. Um, Usually the space that you're mapping to is smaller, so you get some kind of dimensionality reduction, but that doesn't always have to be the case. I've seen cases where it's actually larger and it's just easier to learn in a projected space than it is at the original space. Um, yeah, so basically at its most basic, this lambda will just be a completely random matrix. Uh, that's obviously not the best way to do it, and there's some rules that you can follow around making a good projection. We'll see those next, but uh, first really quickly, maybe this isn't too surprising either, if we have our same corpus, our same TF-IDF uh, encoding, this is the simplest random projection you could possibly think of, where you just multiply it by a completely random, normally distributed matrix, and then this new matrix would be our training data. Yeah, so these two theoretical results are kind of why random projections would work. Uh, the johnson linden strauss says that Random projections approximately preserve uh, relative distance. And maybe these are like gross oversimplifications. So if you're a random projection guru, uh, maybe save it till after the talk. Uh, and then this Heck Nielsen result that says there are many more almost orthogonal directions than there are truly orthogonal in high dimensional space. And this idea of almost uh, orthogonal becomes closer and closer to orthogonal as you get more and more dimensions. Basically what these are saying when you add them up is that your model, if it could tell the difference in full space, it should be able to tell the difference in this X hat space once it's projected. So if things are far apart, they remain far apart, and if they are pointing in different directions, they should remain pointing in different directions once you project them. Um, yeah, it's hard to visualize this sort of thing because you need lots of dimensions to actually do it in any useful way. Uh, but yeah, that's the main idea. So when does this go wrong? Uh, of course you have to allocate this potentially very large document term matrix, which is the number of documents we have by n dimensions, which is the size of our vocabulary that we're keeping track of. Uh, you also have to allocate this potentially large uh, projection matrix, and then do this cubic operation of multiplying them together. Um, Sometimes you can remove some of this headache of just using sparse matrices um, because all of this data can be sparse. Your projection matrix can be sparse. Your document term matrix is sparse for sure. Um, but the alternative method that we'll be looking at random indexing is supposed to be getting around these issues um, of this huge matrix step, as it's called. Yeah, so... This description won't be very clear at the beginning, but of course we have Python code to look at. Uh, so instead of doing this huge matrix multiply, you'll, uh, to save time and memory, I guess, you'll be assigning every feature in your vocabulary a random index vector, which is just some vector of length n with k non-zero values in it. Uh, traditionally, these k non-zero values are just taken from negative one and one, uh, but different flavors differ on what indexes they're choosing. 
Uh, and then you just iterate over your corpus. And for each document, you just add up these vectors. So if you encounter the word dog, you add the word, uh, the index vector for dog to your row for that document. Uh, yeah. So you just accumulate these through your whole corpus for every document. And then at the end, you have this iterative process rather than this um, big uh, matrix multiply that you would have to have both matri matrices and memory for. Maybe this will be a little bit clearer. So we have our corpus again with the punctuation and lowercase everything taken out. Um, and then these are the very randomly assigned index vectors that I did by hand. Uh, and then this is our matrix that we will be outputting and accumulating our vectors on. Um, so for every document in our corpus, we'll be adding the sum of all of its indices to, uh, to that row. That's the whole algorithm. Uh, and then instead of that random projection that we saw before, this random index matrix will be our new training data. Um, this is, I guess, a quadratic operation rather than a cubic for doing the random projection. So you should save a little bit of time, and it for sure saves memory because all you need now is this dictionary uh, and then this hopefully sparse matrix, but I did NumPy so we can all look at it. Yeah, so what did this actually help? Um, like I said, we saved a little bit of memory. Um, we don't need these two big matrices anymore. Um, and we have that quadratic complexity. Um, yeah. So why did we talk about random projections at all? It seems kind of useless. Um, random indexing act turns out to actually approximate a random projection under certain circumstances. Uh, it's the way that you're choosing the non-zero values in those index vectors. Um, Acleoptis in 2001 showed that uh, if you choose your index vectors carefully, uh, you'll be uh, approximating the johnson linden strauss lemma. So that means that when we do the random indexing from our original data, we'll be preserving approximate distance or relative distance. Uh, but we haven't quite done that orthogonality result yet. So how do we get that will be the next question that we answer, which is hopefully solved by lightweight random indexing. Okay, there's a lot going on in this slide. Um, the basic idea is that uh, it takes, um, lightweight random indexing takes the sparsity in your index vectors to be like the most extreme possible, which it sets only two values in the whole index vector to be non-zero. And they're chosen from uh, the set uh, one over the square root of negative, or one over the square root of two. Uh, that's so that every vector has length one, which the authors don't really talk about why is important, but they do talk about why you only choose two values to be non-zero. Uh, and this is basically maximizing the chance that any two index vectors will be orthogonal. Uh, and out of that result, you kind of get an approximation of the Heck-Nielsen result, which um, will cause our resulting matrix to have uh, nearly orthogonal vectors as the result. So things that looked different in the original space will still look different once we apply random indexing. Uh, yeah, and then when we're building our final matrix, we'll also multiply our index vector by the TF-IDF value for any word. Um, this graph, uh, other than me just liking it, uh, this is the probability that any two, uh, two pairwise um, random index vectors will be orthogonal to each other based off of how many non-zero values they have and then how long they are on the, I guess, the y-axis. Uh, basically, this is just saying that the probability is maximized um, when you use one element would be best, but you have to use two elements because if you just use one, you'd just be randomly permuting your feature space, which is not super helpful. Uh, yeah, I think that's the whole thing. So this is Python code to actually build this dictionary. Uh, again, the same example that we've been looking at. Uh, we have our feature names from our vectorizer. We build this dictionary. We'll set our vectors to have length four, uh, two non-zero elements that are being pulled from this non-zero element set. Uh, and then for uh, every word in our vocabulary, we'll just choose the first index deterministically, which is just uh, whatever index that was in the vocabulary mod how long the vector is. And then the next index will just be some random index in the vector that isn't the original one that we picked. Uh, and that's it. Um, 
this is an example resulting index set. You can see that everything is one over the square root of two. So we all know how to do that in our head, right? And it's either positive or negative, that value. Um, yeah, and then so you just apply the same thing that we saw before. You just iterate through your corpus and incrementally add these up to each row that your documents are corresponding to in your document tier matrix. And that's the whole algorithm. Uh, hopefully no one lost their way. We were trying to um, apply this to languages that are uh, data sets that have multiple languages and we sort of didn't really talk about that until right now. Uh, so what do we need to do first to apply this in a useful way? Uh, what we do first is align our um, document term matrices or just our vocabularies if, if we're not building the whole matrix, but this is just good for visualization in this special way, and then project it using uh, lightweight random indexing. So for language one, which is M1 and M2, and language two, which is M3 and M4, uh, we'll align them in this special matrix that has zeros on the off diagonal, and then this uh, common term matrix down the middle. Um, basically what this does is aligns, basically you're just aligning your uh, proper nouns and your cognates, uh, so you're not losing that information across languages. And then you just apply lightweight random indexing to this matrix. Um, not too crazy, but um, this is a little example for just a two document, uh, two language corpus. Um, here's our top document term matrices again that we encoded with TF IDF. Uh, we lost a few stop words and apostrophes, but that's okay. Um, and then we just would take the terms that are unique to the English vocab, terms that are unique to the French vocab, uh, and then terms that are common, set them to be the middle, and then have all the other uh, non-unique terms, or unique terms be on the left and the right. Uh, and that's basically the whole method. So you would apply lightweight random indexing to this matrix and then train a model on top of it. Yeah. So that was the whole method. Like I said, uh, let's look at results from the original paper. So the setup of their experiment was using this RCV1 and 2 data set, which maybe someone has heard of. Uh, it's basically a bunch of uh, Reuters news articles from like the 90s. This is not from the 90s. This was like last week. Um, but yeah, they're publicly available. You can get them through NIST. You just have to like fill out a form or something. And then you will basically try to be applying uh, the Reuters news topics to these data sets or to these uh, documents. Uh, the original paper took out some of the classes because they were too small. Um, and you can go online and get their training and testing stats if you want to reproduce their results. Same example that we saw from before. Uh, yep. So the, these are some final statistics on the data that they actually used. Uh, they took 8,000 news stories from five different languages, English, French, Spanish, uh, German, and Italian. Uh, and then aligned them all, like we saw before, when they got about uh, 15,000 common terms across the entire data set and a total of 100,000 features. So this is a very underdetermined data set. It's very fat and very short. Um, that's okay though, you just have to regularize. Um, yeah, and basically the way that you do this is you just do all versus one classification. You generate 67 different classifiers that are performing just a binary task that says, is this class one or not? Is it class two or not, et cetera? Uh, and then they used uh, micro and macro F1 score, the formula for everyone that forgot it. Um, Basically, macro F1 computes F1 scores for each class and then averages them, and then micro F1 computes uh, true and false positives and false negatives for each class and then applies the F1 formula. Um, macro F1 is going to be treat all classes, treating all classes as if they had the same frequency, and micro F1 will be weighting classes based off of their frequencies. Yeah, so this is basically our pipeline. Uh, we ha start with all of these uh, corpora from different languages, get their TF-IDF uh, embedding encodings, uh, align their vocabularies. We don't need to actually align their data sets, you just need to align their vocabularies. 
uh, to get the common terms across them and then build your lightweight random indexing index vectors. Uh, apply that algorithm that we saw uh, and then build a model on top of the new data set. Okay, and these are the results for English classification. So the naive classifier is just trained on TF-IDF for only English. This is sort of like the baseline of that you would think to do first, where you train uh, one classifier on every single language. Uh, LRI here in this table is the method that we're looking at, uh, trained on all five languages once you apply the uh, lightweight random indexing. And MT is a machine translation um, method where you translate everything with machine translation into English and then train one model on top of it. Um, and for lightweight random indexing, the projected dimension is not reduced. So this is more of like a information encoding task rather than a dimensionality reduction. The authors give a few uh, interesting uh, examples of why this might be working uh, a little bit better than machine trans translation. Um, on saying some, some things around orthogonality when you go from uh, one language to another, you might be, yes, terms are different when you're, when you're looking at nouns, but it might not be the case that um, they're orthogonal to each other when you align them. So when you apply this lightweight random indexing where everything is supposed to be orthogonal to each other, the, the place that you're projecting to will have these terms that may have not been orthogonal in the original data set be orthogonal in the new data set. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of mumbo jumbo for the information may be presented in a more learnable representation. Um, yeah, that's it. So special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Luke for introducing the method to me and Matt and Jody for encouraging me to come present to you good people. Uh, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, so more depth around why it's outperforming machine translation. Um, so they, they gave another kind of argument around why you wouldn't want to use machine translation, and it was around the original statistical properties of your data and then the translated statistical properties of your data might not match up anymore. So this would be like maybe orthogonality of vectors, but things around like uh, distributions of, of word types and things like that, they might change when you apply uh, machine translation where it might kind of like muddy those waters. And then when you use this method, that's just very hard line forcing everything to be orthogonal. Uh, it might just be more learnable. Does that, that make sense?